This morning we're gonna send our kids out to Children's Church before we begin. So we got uh, three and a half years old through seven. You guys can start heading on upstairs to Children's Church. And while they're doing that, if you wanna grab your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter four. As you can tell, we're, we're, we're taking a break in our study of James this morning to focus on the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet yet instead of turning turning to the common narratives in Matthew and in Luke, or turning to John's account of the incarnation in John chapter one, we are turning to the book of Galatians. And the book of Galatians is kind of unique. It's unique because it's, for what we can tell, it's the first book that Paul wrote, and and it's written to a primarily Gentile audience, that is, non-Jewish churches that had been established by Paul and Barnabas on their very first missionary journey. Pretty cool, huh? First letter, first Gentile churches. Yet, Paul's writing because a serious problem started to arise in these churches. And that's that missionaries of a different sort had slipped in to these churches after Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch. On the one hand, these missionaries agreed with Paul and Barnabas. Jesus was God's promised Messiah. They agreed. That's pretty important. But on the other hand, they started to argue that faith in Jesus wasn't enough. Jesus wasn't enough. See, if these non-Jewish Christians wanted to receive God's promise of salvation, they had to do two things. They needed to believe in Jesus, and they needed to obey everything that was written in the law of Moses. That's what these new missionaries said. To put it in simple terms, the message of the gospel that Paul had proclaimed was no longer a gospel of Jesus alone. It became a gospel of Jesus and. Jesus and circumcision. Jesus and observing special days. Jesus and obeying the law of Moses. And it's important for us to grasp this as we begin this morning. Because we should recognize that in our country right now, if we listen to people talk around us, whether it's the people we work with, hang out with, or we watch the news, that it's easy to realize that millions of Americans subscribe to some form of Jesus and Christianity. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody justify their hope of everlasting joy with Jesus Christ by referring to Jesus and something they have done or they are doing? It's Jesus and. Maybe it's Jesus and Sabbath keeping, Jesus and homeschooling, Jesus and commandment keeping. Oh, how about the other side? Jesus and environmental justice. Jesus and. Here's the problem. With with any pursuit of Jesus and Christianity, is it no matter how good and how honorable the and happens to be, it's always opposed to the gospel. It's opposed to the gospel because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so at this point you're going, Mark, what does all this have to do with Christmas? You said this was Christmas, Advent this morning, and you're in Galatians. Well, it's because to address this problem of Jesus and Christianity, Paul points his readers back to three truths that we celebrate every single Christmas. He goes back, and he points us to three things. These will be the outline of our sermon this morning. The faithfulness of God, the reason Jesus came, and the benefit that we receive. Three things that flow from the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his main point is gonna be this is that salvation is not a matter of a person's birthright or their behavior, but their redemption and their adoption through faith alone in Jesus Christ. 
So that's, that's what we're gonna see in these verses today, and this morning we're looking at two verses. Galatians chapter four, verses four and five. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. <coughs> now, now just think about it, I mean, like, what, what's the first thing? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about Christmas as a Christian? First thing. I mean, it could be a lot of things. I mean, I mean it, maybe it's the miraculous events. You know, we, we, have, we have angelic messengers, we have a virgin birth, we have this unexpected star. Those are pretty cool. How, how about the emotional side of it? When we, think of, when we think of Christmas, like all of the turmoil going on in Joseph and Mary's hearts and everything connected to Mary being pregnant, them getting married, and the social shame that's accompanying everything around them while they're going through this period of their life. Maybe it's the abject blindness and the unbelief of the religious leaders. Like, like they, they, these people know their Bible better than anybody else, and they can't figure out that what's happening in front of them has actually been written about already. They don't get it. But one of the things that I think we often need to come back to constantly is that Jesus' arrival is a testimony to the faithfulness of God himself. It's a testimony to the faithfulness of God himself. Now, so what do we see here in Paul's first point in this verse? It's that Jesus arrived at the exact moment in human history when God wanted him to arrive. When the fullness of time had come. God's plan, it's been set in motion. When fullness of time come, God sent his son to be born of a woman. But why does Paul begin here? I I think he wants his readers to recognize that human history is nothing less than the outworking of God's redemptive plan. Human history is nothing less than the the outworking of God's redemptive plan. Every stage of human history, God working. Let's just take a couple minutes and walk through and trace some of the initial contours of this plan that we've already been highlighting in our readings during Advent. Genesis chapter three, we were here two weeks ago. Very first note of God's plan is revealed after an Adam and Eve rebel against God in the Garden of Eden. We, we know from God's clear command, the day you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. They had one command to follow, one. They don't follow it. Yet after they eat it, they don't fall over dead. But in an extension of mercy and grace, God makes a promise. He makes a promise, right? We saw it. A future offspring of the woman would set things right. A future offspring is coming. And to be honest, that that, that promise in Genesis 3.15 is super vague. Some of our Bibles say he's gonna crush Satan's head. Some say bruise his head. So there's this bruising or crushing of a head and, and a bruising of a heel. But what's happening at the exact moment Adam and Eve sin against God? What's going on in their minds as they're being exiled from the garden? They're looking and they're longing for this promised son to come. They're looking for him. 
Eve had hoped her firstborn son, Cain, would be the son, but he wasn't. Nor, nor was any of her, her, her other biological sons. I mean, human history slogged forward after the fall in this ever-increasing downward spiral to the place that God judges sinful mankind. He wipes the slate clean in a flood. He brings one family through Noah and his sons. Yet once again, after the flood, it becomes clear that Noah and his sons are not the son that God had promised to Adam and Eve. It's clear in the text. In fact, we follow, we follow what happens after the flood. It, again, it doesn't get better. It goes down again, just like after Cain. It spirals down as we see Noah's descendants and his son's descendants decide they're not gonna obey God. They're not gonna spread across the earth. No, we are going to build a tower. It's gonna keep us together. We're gonna make our name great. And God judges them again. He doesn't put them to death like he did in the flood though rightfully so, God could have. He spreads them across the earth by confusing their languages. And from this collection of sinful and rebellious families, in his mercy and grace, God chose an idol-worshiping man by the name of Abram to follow him. We've already read about it this morning. Genesis 12, one through three. Now the Lord said to Abram, go away from your country and your kindred and your father's house and to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And as we look at this promise, it's clear there's promises that are made to Abraham. He's gonna, God's gonna make him a great nation. He's gonna make his name great. But if we slow down and ask the question, who are these families of the earth that are gonna be blessed through Abraham? Who are the families? What, what kind of blessing are they gonna receive? Well, if we happen to look up the Hebrew noun behind our English word families in chapter three, we can actually see a direct link in Genesis chapter 10 at the end. The very, very same word is used, though in most of our Bibles it's not translated with the same word families. In the ESV it's translated as clans. Let's go to Genesis 10, 32. These are the clans, that is the families, the very same word. These are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations and from these the nations spread abroad across after the flood. See the thing that's not explicitly stated but is clearly implied in the use of this word families is that God is promising to bless all of the sinful, idol-worshiping families of the earth, all of those families that spread out from Babel. He's going to bless them through Abraham's future family. As we continue reading the story, we discover this promise will be happening through a son in Abram's family line. We think of the fullness of time God's plan working out. It works out one stage at a time right after the account where God asks Abram to sacrifice his son, Genesis 22. The angel stops him and there's a promise made. I will surely bless you. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemy and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you obey my voice. And the key here is this is a singular noun. Offspring. Not plural, offsprings, offspring. We're looking for a person, we're looking for a him. God is promising again a link that goes back to the promise. And if we had the time this morning, we could track this promise. 
as it's handed down from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob who's later renamed Israel. Even more, we could track how this promise is fulfilled, to this promise to fulfill these earlier promises comes about in the promises of the reign of a future Messiah king who's gonna arise from the tribe of Judah and from the kingly lineage of David. Our entire Old Testament strung through with these promises pointing to one who is going to straighten things out. One future male heir, one future son of woman. So when we read the fullness of time would come, it's the fullness of God's promises that have been stacking on one after another, after another, after another. Constantly pointing for us, pointing us forward to the promises of God, promising there's something that's gonna happen. Fullness of time come, and it happens in Jesus Christ. Every promise built on earlier promises. And see, when we recognize this, we're able to see that God's plan of redemption is not just the central storyline of the Bible, it's the fundamental story of human history itself. In fact, as we turn our attention back to Galatians 4, Paul appears to be viewing his human history through this very lens because he alludes to God's very first promise in Genesis 3.15. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his forth his son to be born of a woman. The promise in Genesis 3.15, future offspring of woman. Paul's linking this together here for us to see what God is doing. And it's like this, this promised son when he comes, he didn't materialize out of thin air. He, he didn't descend out of heaven in a blinding light. He was born in flesh and blood in strict accordance with God's promises. See, Olympic, when we talk about the faithfulness of God, when we talk about God's faithfulness, this is the degree to which we can truly see his faithfulness. God always fulfills his promises. But there's an even greater truth to be seen in his faithfulness. If Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise, if he is, if he is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to our first parents in the garden, what, what, what is the implication of this? We see, it, we see it over and over again in the New Testament, but just if we take it back to Genesis, it means that Jesus is the only person that can restore sinful human beings to God. He's fulfilling the promise from the beginning. This isn't something that happens in the middle. God's promise from the beginning anchored in Jesus Christ. Yet this very affirmation about the work and faithfulness of God, the, the, the uniqueness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, presses us to an important question that can come from those who subscribe to a Jesus and view of salvation. It might sound something like this. So what's wrong? What's wrong with believing in Jesus and keeping the law of Moses? What's wrong? Well, well, Paul points us to the answer as he explains the reason that Jesus came. Back to Galatians. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. This is the reason that Jesus came. So you might ask, why do we need to be redeemed from the law? Why? I mean, I mean, after all, doesn't God's law express his holy and perfect character? 
Doesn't the law come to us, show us how we should live a life in which we can find joy and and satisfaction in this life? God's law protects us from doing the very things that aren't good for us? Well, if we understand the true function of the law, the function of the law will recognize the fact that no one in the history of the world has ever been restored to God through their observation of the law. No one has been restored to God in the history of the world. Paul tells us this earlier in Galatians chapter three starting in verse 10. He says all those who rely on the law, on works of the law are under a curse. Those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the law, the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Now, so what are we seeing here? Why, why, why is any pursuit of Christianity that tries to combine Jesus and law keeping as the grounds of their hope? Why, why, why is that wrong? Well, Paul, Paul's very explicit here. To be under the law is to be under a curse. Those are pretty hard words. These are coming from a man who had supported the law, held it in the highest regard as a Pharisee. To be under the law is to be under a curse. Why? Because unless you keep it perfectly, unless you never fail in one place, it brings curse. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things and do them. There's no picking and choosing. It's all or nothing. And it's important to point this out here at this stage because we've been going through the book of James. The kind of doing that Paul is talking about here is not the same kind of doing that James has been talking about. The kind of doing that, that the kind of doing that's here is about relying on one's commandment keeping for a right standing with God. That that's the kind of thing that Paul's worried about. People looking to how good they're doing obeying the law to be like, hey, I'm doing good. I'm right with God. I got a solid 80%. You say no. Unless you get 100%, you're cursed. The kind of of works that James has been focused on is, is rightful behavior that flows out of our faith. An obedience for the glory of God, an obedience because we delight in God and we see his commands are not, not, not a burden. It's not a way of, of earning our salvation or maintaining our salvation. It's, it's evidence that we've truly been saved. See, anybody who anchors their hope, anybody who tries to find hope in the goodness of their behavior and how decent they do at following God's law is always going to find out it doesn't work out. They don't understand the function of the law. One more text to make it even more clear. Romans chapter three, verse 20. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Not one. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. How many people will be justified? That is declared righteous in God's sight. The number is zero. And we wonder why, why is that the case? I mean, if God gave us the law, Why is it zero? Well, Paul tells us why. It's because the law is a sin detector, not a righteousness indicator. The law is a sin detector, it is not a righteousness indicator. To use an illustration that I've used before, the law functions like a smoke detector, not like a fuel gauge. 
There's a difference between a smoke detector and a fuel gauge in your car, right? You're driving down the road, you look down at your dash, you have three quarter tank of fuel, you have 50 more miles to go, and unless you're driving a gas guzzler that has ne like, like never been seen before, you know you can get there, right? But when we look at our fuel gauge when we're traveling cross country, we know it's time to stop and get fuel. We have a full tank, three quarter tank, half tank, quarter tank. But the law doesn't work like that. It functions like a smoke detector. Smoke detector does one thing. It detects smoke. When smoke is detected, what does it do? It goes off. And it doesn't care whether the smoke is coming from grandpa's birthday candles, burnt cookies, or a, or a devastating house fire. Smoke detector's going off. Can you imagine how horrible it would be to have that as your gas gauge? As long as there's fuel in my tank, no sound. The moment I run out of fuel, it goes off. And the moment it goes off, my engine goes off. And I go, well, that was really helpful. See, this is why the law is a curse. It's why nobody will be justified in God's sight through the law. The law does one thing and it does it impeccably well. It points out our every failure and our every sin in a way that we are without excuse. See, when Jesus tells it, Paul tells us that Jesus was born under the law, it means that Jesus was born under the very same standard. He was born under a standard that's perfectly designed to expose, expose the slightest hint of sin or failure in our life. He lived under the same thing. But Jesus never sinned, not one time. He lived a perfect life of obedience before God under the law. Every step of the way, not a single failure. And why did he do it? He did it to redeem sinful humans, that's you and me, from the curse of the law. The very thing that stood over us, constantly saying, you have failed and you are doomed to everlasting judgment. The very thing that stood against us, he came to redeem us from. And this is important because, because does Jesus teach in the Gospels? I hope your answer is yes, Jesus teaches. Does Jesus teach us about the law in the Gospels? Yes, he does. And there are those who would like to say, well, Jesus merely came to teach us how to rightly understand the law so we can fully keep the law. And that answer is absolutely wrong. His point in teaching about the law was to constantly show us that we couldn't do it. Like, read through the clear explanations on the Sermon on the Mount and you realize they're not there to help us obey better, but to show us how badly we fail. We need to be redeemed from the law. And when we think of redemption, what is it? I mean, we look at the first century culture, it's, it's really clear. Most of us understand it in the, the concept of redeem, to buy back. But, but in the first century, redeeming was, was normally a context of slavery. Somebody comes alongside who is willing to pay for somebody's slave to buy them out of slavery that they might go live as a free person the rest of their lives. Redemption, living in slavery, being purchased, freed. Yet you think about it, this act of redemption requires at least two things of the redeemer. It requires them to have compassion and mercy, and it requires them to have the financial means to purchase the slave's freedom. It's clear Jesus has both of those. Because you think about it, like compassion without cash isn't gonna purchase anybody's freedom. 
And cash without compassion isn't gonna do anybody any good. Jesus has both. He has both, he meets the criteria. His entire ministry, born under the law, born under a law which it, it exists to do nothing but to show failure and to show sin and he lives underneath that yet in compassion and love with everybody else around him. To prove, to prove that he had the means to purchase our freedom in his perfectly sinless life. 1 Peter 2.22, speaking of Jesus, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And we all know Jesus didn't buy us with silver and gold. He didn't, he didn't buy us with a cashier's check. He redeemed us through his substitutionary death on the cross. The death that we deserved, the punishment that was rightfully ours, he took in our stead. That's redemption. forever satisfying God's just and righteous wrath against our sin. It's not a small thing that Jesus is doing. Paul puts it this way earlier in Galatians 3, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The price of our redemption is not small. It is not insignificant. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now this is heavy news, but it is certainly good news. But Paul doesn't stop here. He goes to the best news. Like, like the news keeps getting better about Jesus coming as the fulfillment of God's plan. Jesus doesn't redeem us from the curse of the law and just send us on our way. I mean, I think we could all see that happening. Maybe a freed slave gets purchased, gets bit, bought, bought back, and the guy says, hey, you have your life ahead of you, go. You're free. But we have it better in Christ. Jesus redeemed us from our slavery to the law that helpless slaves might be adopted into God's family as his own sons. It's one thing for somebody to redeem a slave from slavery, it's another for them to redeem them out of slavery and to adopt them as their very own son. That's what God does for us. In fact, this imagery of being adopted as sons through Jesus Christ puts, points us really to two monumental implications as we, as we think of the benefit that we receive. Number one, this, this picture of adoption points us to the reality that no one is a natural born child of God. Let that sink in. No one is a natural born child of God. It doesn't matter whether you were born in a Jewish family, it doesn't matter if you were born kids in a Christian family, it doesn't matter if you were circumcised at birth as a boy or, or, or you were baptized as an infant in a Christian church. No one is a natural born child of God. No one. You can't hope in your parents' religion for your own salvation. You can't put your hope in their church going, in their good behavior, in their devotion to Jesus. No one is a natural born child of God. 
The only way to become a child of God is if we stop trusting in ourselves and embrace Jesus as our only hope of salvation. It's the only way. John 1, starting in verse 10, speaking of the coming of Jesus, John puts it this way. He was in the world. Jesus was in the world. And the world was made through him. Yet the world didn't know him. He came unto his own people, and and his own people didn't receive him. But here's the contrast. But to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave them right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, why why, why do Jews need to abandon their pursuit of the law and, and embrace Christ alone? Why do people from other religions, whatever religion they happen to be pursuing right now, why do those people need to abandon their religions and embrace Jesus Christ alone? Why does an atheist need to forsake the rejection of God and embrace Christ alone? It's because no one is a natural born child of God. No matter how nice and pleasant your neighbors may be, if they haven't come to faith in Christ, they are not children of God. But the implications don't end here. Paul points us to the monumental privilege that's anchored in our adoption as sons. In our our day and age, I know it can kind of sound sexist or out of place to say we're adopted, we're God's adopted sons by faith in Christ instead of saying we are God's adopted sons and daughters. It can sound that way but there is a monumental privilege that Paul wants us to see in this adoption. I mean, all we have to do is look back at the historical context of the first century to recognize who received the family inheritance. First century. The boys. They received it. The male children. Especially in a Jewish context. And, and, and if, we, if we look back, we can understand one of the primary reasons for this is, is normally there was a family estate. There's, there's property that's being handed down and it's kept in the family name. So it's the way of, of keeping the family name moving, keeping the family property together. It's passed down to the male heirs. But now if we apply this to what Paul is saying to Christians, both men and women, He's saying to be an adopted son is to be a legal heir with every benefit. When you come to faith in Christ, man or woman, boy or girl, you receive every benefit of inheritance. Nothing is held back, nothing is restricted. Joint heirs in Christ. we receive the same privileges. And this ultimately means there are no second class citizens or undesirable children in the family of God. We feel that way as humans, we look around, we we have our own way of rating life, but what does God's word tell us? What does it mean to be adopted as a son? It means there's no second class citizens. No red headed stepchildren. No. Equal heirs in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your background was. If you embrace Jesus as your only hope of salvation, you will receive everything that God has promised. Not, not by the nature of your ethnic identity or your nationality or your gender or, and certainly not at your futile attempts at law keeping. 
trying to be a good person. No, it'll be on one account, your redemption through faith alone in Jesus alone. The message of the gospel is always Jesus alone. Becoming a child of God. As we said at the beginning, it's not a matter of one's birthright. Parents, our children need to know this clearly. Children, you need to know this. No one becomes a child of God as a matter of birthright. You don't become a child of God as a matter of good behavior. But redemption and adoption through Jesus Christ alone. So as we finish, why don't we just ask the question, what does it look like? Let's let's be explicit about the gospel today. How do we become God's children? I I, I want to lay it out with with kind of four four key things this morning. We'll keep it short. We need to recognize, first of all, our desperate condition. If we're we're gonna become God's children through faith, we need to understand where we're at. We need to recognize our desperate estate. Back to Romans 30. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If we get the law wrong, we get everything wrong. If we understand the implications that's being laid out here for us, we can quickly understand no one is good enough for God. Nobody's gonna get into heaven because they can say, look, I was better than somebody else. We're condemned. We are equally condemned under the law. So that's the first thing we need to recognize, our desperate condition. The second thing that we need to recognize is God's love. Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No, notice, notice, I wanna be very explicit. God's love is not manifest in that he allows everybody to, receive eternal joy. Everybody doesn't get to go to heaven. While we were still sinners, how did God show his love? He showed his love in that Christ died for us. That's how his love is manifest. So in recognizing God's love, we also need to recognize what Jesus freely offers. Romans three, picking up at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Notice, what does the law do? The law curses, the law condemns, the law shows each and every sin that I've ever committed. But now there's a righteousness of God and it's manifest apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. That's just simply saying the Old Testament is pointing forward to the day that this is gonna happen. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. How do we become righteous in God's sight? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And it gets even better, there's no distinction. Oh man, we need to hear that today. There's no distinction. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We need to recognize how does the gospel work? What has Christ done? And finally, we need to actually respond to it. It's not just enough to know these things we must respond to it. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse nine. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. 
for, for it is with the heart one believes and is justified, and it's with the mouth that one is confessed and is saved. See, as we celebrate this time of Christmas, we do celebrate. We celebrate the faithfulness of God. We celebrate the reason that Jesus came. But as Christians, most of all, we celebrate the benefits that we receive in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't done that, please come talk to me after the service. I'd love to share with you. If you wanna understand what it means to, to, to pray and receive Christ as your savior, I'm here. Because we need to remember as we close that no one is a natural born child of God. Let's pray together.